encoding. So how do you encode a video signal? We've sampled, we quantized it. Now we have to encode it, which involves some forms of compression. So what I'm going to do is overview some simple forms of compression that will show up in satellite links. No matter how complicated the, the protocol is and how complicated the compression scheme is, there are actually only a handful of principles that you need to know. And everything that a complicated protocol is doing is really just some combination or twiddling on these basic foundational principles. <clears throat> OK. Well, that was the example that we just went through to motivate the fact that we need compression because we can't simply sample and quantize video signals or even audio signals and efficiently, efficiently use them and transmit them. So there are actually two types of compression. The first one I'm going to talk about is lossless data compression. This is representing a common and a recurring combination of bits with a reduced alphabet. Uh, usually reduces a digital data set to a smaller number of bits. I say usually because more often than not, if I take some randomly generated signal and I try to compress it, unless I get lucky, the file that I wind up being, or the bit stream that I wind up at the end, is usually larger than what I started with. The good news is that we don't usually transmit random stuff. Our stuff has patterns in it that we can take advantage of. And that's the whole idea behind lossless compression. I'm going to take a reduced alphabet. I'm going to use that to represent the patterns that occur frequently in my signal. And I will res reserve some, maybe some larger data blocks, uh, some, some uh, lengthier parts of my alphabet, and match them to the infrequently occurring sequences of ones and zeros or characters or whatever le at whatever level I'm compressing. And that will redistribute the representation in such a way that I reduce the size of my, ultimately the size of the number of bits that I'm transmitting. So the thing about lossless compression is that there is no loss of data. I must be able to re perfectly reconstruct the bits. And so this would be something that you'd want to transfer data with, right? You don't want to lose bits when you're downloading an app or a file or a text file, an e-book, whatever. There's, there are other things, for example, video that we'll get into later, where loss is tolerable. Loss is tolerable. OK, no loss of real data. And what are some examples of this? So if you've ever heard the term Huffman encoding or the Lempel-Ziv algorithm, those are examples of uh, lossless image co compression or just lossless compression techniques in general. Specifically for images, uh, if you see any file extension that says PCX, GIF, LZW, ZIP, PNG, those include lossless forms of compression. Very similar to the type that I'll uh, show you in a second. So here's, here's my example, just to illustrate the concept. It's an example I made in about 10 minutes in my office one day. An example of lossless compression. So here is my sentence, my test sentence. It's 101 characters. I'm going to work this at the alphabet level instead of the bit level because it's much easier to explain that way. I am really excited that the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets have a chance to beat the dogs in November. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I'm I, am, I hope it's true. And uh, I am going to compress this statement. I'm going to invent a form of compression. I'm going to call it Z compression. This is Professor Durgan's invention. This does not exist. This would never exist because it's actually very crummy. But it serves to illustrate a purpose. Z compression. I'm going to take the letter that I hate the most in the alphabet because it never occurs. It's going to be Z. And I'm going to have to come up with a little code here. Wherever a Z occurs in my sentence, I'm going to take the next letter, add it to the Z, and then replace it according to the following key, which I've outlined below. Well, first of all, I can't just get rid of Zs, because sometimes Z occurs in a word. And so I'm going to designate the two-letter sequence ZZ as representing a Z. Uh, 
And I'm going to use ZA to represent T-H-E with the space, because I know the with the space is always showing up in English. And I know that that with the space, and E-D, things end in E-D all the time in English with the space after it. And the word, the preposition in, that's always happening in English. And I have the have, have is a, I am, and never occurs without an I, and they're usually distinct words, so why don't I group it together and make that Z-F. Every time Z-F shows up, I'm going to put that in. An E-D with a period. Often I end sentences that way. So this is a marvelous little strategy for removing space in a text and reducing it. And look, wow, it looks almost like gibberish now. I've, I've done the substitutions. And look at that. I've reduced it down to 82 characters with this really crummy scheme that I invented in my office. What a great thing. Now, keep in mind, if, if this was a random sequence, if I fed in random letters, well, chances are I would have just as many, you know, I, I'd have these Zs, which would double. If a Z appeared in the original input sequence, I would have to represent it with two letters instead of one, and I would be losing ground as fast as I would be gaining ground with all of these savings because the chances of these other patterns showing up are highly improbable. So they wouldn't, wouldn't really save me anything. So it's not an effective scheme unless it's an English sentence. So there it is. That's all you need to know about lossless compression. I've got a couple other examples about real schemes that weren't invented in an office in 10 minutes. But it's the same exact principle. Why do we lose? Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples here. The challenge of lossless data compression, most video and images have patterns that can be exploited for lossless data compression. So you don't usually use lossless data compression for images and video. You never use it for video because we just need to wring too much redundancy or too many bits out of that stream. For some images that we want to preserve at very high quality, we sometimes use lossless compression. There is one other problem, though. And that is different images, in particular, have different pattern sets. So one could imagine that I would use the same type of scheme that I used on the English sentence as I would on uh, a landscape picture with trees and sky. I know that the color blue and the color green and certain gradations are going to appear more frequently, so I can slant the alphabet that way and reduce that picture dramatically in size and representation. The problem is not all pictures are skies and trees and mountains. Some pictures are people. Some pictures are cute kittens on Pinterest. You know, you, there's no way to have a universal predefined coder and actually have it operate efficiently in that point. So we actually have two options. We can do what I did on the previous slide, and I can assume an a priori pattern that I know, or there's a clever way to use an ad hoc pattern that you build as you go. In other words, you build the cipher or the coder, the, the, the key that we had on the previous slide, by first making a pass through the data that you're compressing and and kind of building what you think should be the code book for that. And that's where most of these techniques use. So let's uh, classify a couple of these schemes ahead of time. Run length encoding is actually an option one type scheme. Run length encoding says that my data sequence is going to have a lot of rep repeated bits in it. So you're assuming that repetition is the principal pattern in your signal. This is uh, used in a lot of image encoding and was really gained favor when the fax machine came out. Because if you think about it, a black and white fax is uh, mostly a lot of white followed by little blips of of uh, black ink if you do things scan line by scan line as a fax does. And so if the fax machine had to transmit um, raw, raw zeros and ones without coding, without compression, we would never have had faxes in the 60s or 70s 
or whenever they were invented. We probably had to wait till the 90s before we could transmit a page. But with run length encoding, which basically says, I'm going to put a flag bit sequence inside my data stream, and whenever I see uh, a rep repeated character, it's going to be that character flag, that character, and then the length of the repetition. So anything that has a lot of repetition in it, like a, a document scan, uh, compresses well with this run length encoding. But it's not very smart. If I try to use run length encoding on like a photograph, I probably will wind up, in some instances, increasing the number of bits I need to represent it. Uh, here's a scheme called Huffman coding. This, again, is an option one type scheme where you uh, rearrange your binary alphabet so that now you're not going to give four bits for these 16 characters. You have, I've, this is an example of uh, 16 common um, characters and their frequency of occurrence in the English language. So uh, space is seven, N and E are four, you don't go down the road to U and X, you find those don't occur very often relative to the other ones. So there's relative occurrence. And you assign a code. The short codes you give to the space, because that occurs a lot. And the long codes you give to the infrequently occurring thing. And the code is structured in such a way so that there's no ambiguity. Like there's no, um, if, if you get... You, you can't mistake one for the other, the way it's arranged. It's still uniquely interpretable. And that's just by rearranging the number of, of bits and where they occur. You make this thing called a Huffman tree. There's a really nice algorithm for generating this once you have a frequency of occurrence. And you can compress data that way. And now here's an option two scheme, the lempel ziv algorithm. This is a build the pattern as you go. It's a very basic adaptive algorithm. It's easy to in implement with minimal memory. And it's incorporated to all sorts of image and video data. Uh, it was used in an early compression algorithm called deflate, which eventually became zip, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. That's probably the most common archiving uh, tool for compressing files. Again, we want to use lossless compression on these files. So this winds up being a nice way to do it. And if you can show that the, out, the, the data has patterns in it and it is extremely long, in the limit of an infinite file size, this actually approaches the Shannon capacity or the, the Shannon compression limit that you'd predict with information theory. Okay. So let me give you an example of how the... <coughs> The lempel ziv algorithm works. So here's my sentence. Those lame dogs lose the games. So how does the lempel ziv work? Well, you go through that sentence to build a key first. How do you build the key? Well, you find every unique occurrence in that sequence, and you register it in the key. So first you come to a T, a lowercase t. That's a unique occurrence. So you register that as the first element in your alphabet. Then you come across an H. That's the second occurrence. You put it in the second slot. O, S, E. Well, this doesn't seem to be going anywhere, does it? We're, ju we're just repeating every unique character that we've come across. Space, L, A, M, O. I'm repeating myself. I already have an E in the key. So the second E at the end of lame, I'm going to encode E and the space that comes after it. And that's going to be, the two of those things together are going to be my tenth element. D, oh, O has already occurred, so I'm going to take O and G as my next element. My next element, S, S has already occurred, so I'm going to register S space in the key. And so forth and so on. So you can see if I go down and I build that alphabet in that way. So now when I go to encode that, 
what I do is I encode whatever comes before that and then the letter, the, the letter in that alphabet uh, that, uh, that is in my key. So for example, zero would say nothing comes before T and then there's a T, so zero T. And the next thing, H, I encode that as 0H in my final output. The next thing, 0O, 0S, 0E, 0 space, 0L, 0A, 0M. 5 space. There's an E and then there's a space. So 5 space is the next character. And that's also, of course, uh, the tenth element in my alphabet. So I'm building my key as I go. I've included it into the data, and I'm building it as I go. And you can probably see from how we generated that, that any pat if there are repeated patterns that show up in the text, that that's going to be reflected in the key. I'm going to start to see those pop up in the key, and it will allow me to replace with reduced uh, characters. Now here's the bad news. How many characters is that? I took a, a sentence that was relatively short, and I think I added like, I don't know, 30% of length to it if I count the characters up. So for short sentences, this is not a very good algorithm. If this is like war and peace, then it's a great algorithm because you'll pick out all the patterns that come up and it'll compress quite nicely without loss of data. <clears throat> to give that a... To, to emphasize that a little more, I did a ones and zeros example of a longer sequence, and I have a very contrived sequence. I have a, just a square wave, a, a zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one uh, stream of 73 bits. I built it into, I parsed it into the way that the lempel ziv algorithm would parse it, and then I represented it the way that the lempel ziv algorithm would represent it. And you see I actually do go from 73 bits to 64 bits. And in the limit, if I had an infinite number of bits, I'd find that compression ratio would actually get close to zero for the lempel ziv. It doesn't look like it from here, but if I have millions and millions of bits of ones and zeros, it would eventually key in on that pattern. And the representation, the bits that I'd use to represent that alternating ones and zeros would grow much slower than the actual ones and zeros that I fed into it, making the compression ratio quite, quite low. So that's how the lempel ziv works. Uh, final qu comment about this. Sampling, quantization, and compression are not independent designs in communication. All three of these operations that we talked about today if you really want to optimize it for a particular medium, video, speech, sensor data, you do all these three things together. But it's quite a challenging design problem to do that. Sometimes it's just more straightforward to use a uniform linear quantizer, a compander if necessary, sample it uh, independently, and then use something like the lempel ziv algorithm or run length encoding to reduce your data set. Okay. Well, we are we have about five minutes left. So when we come back on Thursday, what I'll do is we'll start talking about lossy image compression. Because as I mentioned earlier, the eye is very forgiving. Generally in video, if you can throw away information in a video capture and have it be relatively insensitive to uh, the human eye, you want to take that trade off because it saves you an order of magnitude of bits that you have to transmit or more by going from lossless to lossy compression. So admit, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about how the JPEG algorithm works because that's a version of that is actually applied
to moving video images in uh, the MPEG uh, standards that are used to encode digital satellite video. And we'll talk about the trade-offs, and I'll give some examples of some pictures and images uh, so that we understand the trade-offs. And uh, we'll be well on our way to being uh, video transmission experts. Then once we do all this baseband stuff, that'll, that'll only take maybe about 20 or 30 minutes. Then for the rest of the class on Thursday, what we'll be doing is uh, getting into actual modulation. Okay, I've got all these bits. I've squeezed as much excess bits that I need to transmit out of the channel as possible. Now I need to send them across a radio channel. How do I send digital information across a radio channel and not tick off people that are my spectral neighbors and maintain the data rate that I need to? What is the uncompressed bit rate required to send a voice signal at 60 dB signal to noise ratio. And that's a measure of quantization distortion. We're not talking about the communications channel. This is uh, medium agnostic. We don't even, it could be wireless, it could be satellites, it could be cellular. It could even be a wire, it could be Ethernet. Uh, this could be voice over IP. Uh, which the, when you average all the packets that are flowing through for voice over IP, if we set the voice channel uncoded, what would the required bit rate be on average? Of course, in voice over IP, everything is packetized and it's chunks of voice data. And hopefully you process it so fast that you don't even notice that there's a, a delay or a blip in there. You delay it enough so that you can collect the packets in real time and send the voice signal. Well, we said last time that a voice or an audio channel, the human hear, ear, can hear signals with a maximum frequency content of about... 20 kilohertz. There's some superhumans out here that hear a little bit higher than that. I am not one of them. Uh, and, but, you know, most of the time you can, you can get a pretty decent, um, as we illustrated last time, we can get a pretty decent audio signal if we keep everything below 20 kilohertz, even if we throw the higher stuff away. That means that I need to sample at the Nyquist rate, which is twice the maximum frequency content. This will keep me from aliasing the signal. I will now have spectral copies that are non-overlapping, and I can reproduce that signal by simply low-pass filtering the last copy out. And I get perfect without any loss of fidelity when I do that operation. So that would require a 40 kilohertz sample per second. Okay, now... Now I've got to quantize, and this is where I actually introduced the distortion. What was the rule of thumb that we said last time? Well, for every bit, n, if I'm sending n bits per sample, for every bit per sample that I use to quantize a bit, that gives me 2 to the n levels, and that will result in a signal-to-noise ratio of 6n. Now, what are the assumptions? That assumes that I'm using an ideal Uniform quantizer means I have done something in my signal to make sure its dynamic range fits within the limits, just barely within the limits of my ideal quantizer, uh, and that the amplitude distribution is uniform within that. And sometimes I have to run it through a special device to make sure that happens. What was that device called? The thing that maps something like human speech or uh, music or audio signals into s uh, a signal that kind of fits that uniform quantizer assumption. What was it? Uh, that's, that's the next step. The A to D converter is the thing that quantizes. Before we get to the quantizer to condition my signal, 
in order to make the most out of my A to D converter, which is usually a uniform quantizer, what do I put it through? It started with a C. Not a word you hear very much in telecommunications nowadays, but I'm losing my hearing in my left side, so I've got to listen with this ear. Oh, maybe this is the ear that I'm losing my hearing in, because I don't hear anything. Were you all asleep last night? It was called a compander, a compander. You compand the signal, quantize, transmit. Then you go from D to A instead of A to D. And then you decompand, which is reverse the operation of your distortion. So you distort the signal in such a way that it quantizes nicely. An alternative nowadays, because quantizers are getting very, very cheap, the A to D hardware is very cheap, and you can get 16-bit quantizers or more, sometimes you just pop that signal right into the quantizer and you take your lumps on the chin because you, you've over-designed your A to D converter. That's another strategy because of the cheapness of this hardware. The compander may be actually more expensive. The qu compander and uh, 8-bit quantizer may be more expensive than the 12-bit quantizer. So just go ahead and do it that way. Who cares? Right? So if that's the case, we need 60 dB of SNR. That's a fairly decent, clean-sounding audio signal. You could probably hear beyond that, some of you audiophiles, but this will get a decent conversation going. So if 6N equals, and this is in dB, that rule of thumb for a uniform linear quantizer, N is the number of bits, this must be equal to 60 dB or greater. That means N is 10 bits per sample. 10 bits per sample, 40 samples per second. I need to send 400 kilobits per second. Now, if you recall, I think somebody, John Luca, might have been you, uh, that asked, what is a typical cell phone operate at in terms of data bits per second when it does the operation of vocoding, voice encoding, which includes, as part of it, quantization and sampling, sampling and quantization, and some basic encoding, taking advantage of some of the patterns in your speech to optimize the bits. What was that rate? Does anybody remember that we quoted? It was 8 kilobits per second. Wow, that is a factor of 50 difference. What are we missing? How do we get from here to here? Well, there's a couple ways. First of all, we mentioned last time that uh, the, the sampling and the quantization is a lot more complicated for realistic optimized signals. In order to get close to the rate distortion theorem predictions that Shannon made many, many years ago, and to get the optimal quantization, use something called vector quantization, where quantization is operating on two or more samples at a time. The more samples that you incorporate in your vector quantization, the more you asymptotically get closer to the rate distortion theorem predictions. So use a much more complicated quantizer than we one of the one that we've outlined here. You also take advantage of some structure in the signal. For example, um, some temporal structure in addition to some amplitude structure, which means your vo voice encoder is going to be optimized for human conversation. It's not going to work that well for other types of audio signals. You can see this very easily. First of all, a lot of uh, voice encoders are optimized for languages. I've heard, I've heard that uh, voice encoders optimize for Farsi, which I think is a, uh, the language in Iran, Persian, old Persian language. Uh, that language is actually terrible if you speak English to it and vice versa for some reason. Just the, the distribution of amplitudes and the temporal correlations of a voltage signal coming out of a microphone of somebody speaking Farsi is very different than, than English. Who knew? Who knew? You could probably do a little experiment at home to illustrate this like better than anything. If you start playing your favorite musical song and you dial it up on the cell phone, you can grab two cell phones, your friends and your own, make a ch 
uh, voice call to your own cell phone and put your friend's cell phone in front of the speaker and listen to it. The music doesn't sound very good at all because it's simply a different distribution in time and in amplitude of, uh, au of audio signal compared to what your voice encoder is designed for. Now, you take that same song, you download it on iTunes, and you, you know, or you, you rip the, the MP3 and you send it via a data transfer to your phone. Completely different story. Completely different story. It sounds perfect. Why it's not a limitation of your phone's speaker, it's the encoding technique that was used to optimize the voice channel. And so that's one of the reasons. And of course, a really big part of that optimization is that in addition to all this, there's compression, a form of compression being used. And in the case of the voice encoder, a really efficient voice encoder will be doing all of those things together, sampling, quantizing, and compressing at the same time, optimized in a way to the signal. Now, how does it get that? One of the things that, that it tolerates is lossy compression. Lossy compression. Voice and, and, and video, you can tolerate to varying degrees loss in your signal. And as long as it's a special kind of loss, your human senses are somewhat insensitive to its occurrence. And in fact, we kind of worked through that exercise last time. And when we, when we play different types of distortion on audio clips, your ear is actually very sensitive and could pick out a lot of distortions. However, there are some, uh, some things that as long as you got them right, you got most of the signal right, like the level crossings. When we went down to one-bit quantization. Um, and so if you did get certain characteristics of an audio or a video signal right, there's a lot of margin for error outside of that. And so if you allow for... Loss, lossy compression, the idea of um, not being able to reconstruct a perfect signal, just a close enough signal, you wind up saving yourself orders of magnitude in the number of bits that you need to, to represent a signal. And so that's what today's talk is going to be on. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back to PowerPoint slides, largely because we've got some images to look at today. Um, not only do I need to... to blast through some material, but we've got some images to look at today uh, where we illustrate lossy and lossless compression in the context of video. I personally hate PowerPoint, don't you? Does anybody really like crave classes that are PowerPoint based? I try to do everything at the board, but this is the one unit where we have to kind of blow through a lot of material, and there's a lot of visual graphics. When I was uh, um, my first year in grad school, I went to this conference. It was my first conference presentation ever. I wrote a little paper and it got accepted. And I think it was the, I should believe, Vehicular Technology Conference. This was 1997. It's almost 20 years ago. And uh, I, I went to my very first conference session. And of course, you know, my, I was a wet behind the years grad student, so you know, my knees were kind of buckling. And I was going to present like the next day, but I was really nervous. But, but it was really cool, too. You see these people, it's like, oh, yeah, I referenced that guy's paper. I know him. He's a famous researcher. Oh, yeah, that's, pre that's a pretty good. He wrote that other paper that I liked. Oh, that, that guy wrote that paper that I hate. I see that. But, you know, you got all these people that are, you know, the brokers of ideas and research in your community. And I was just overwhelmed as, an uh, as a grad student. And I go into this first session. I was like, what is this going to be like? I was feeling nervous for my own presentation. Well, the first presentation was this poor Japanese guy whose English wasn't very good. He was reading everything, and he was even more nervous than I was. And he was reading everything off of, like, index cards in that kind of, like, uh, monotonic bullet staccato that uh, j good Japanese is always meant to be spoken in, which translates terribly into English. And then after that, I was feeling a little bit better. I was like, I saw a couple more presentations. The best presentation, though, was in that session, and it was uh, by a Canadian professor. It was the best presentation I saw that entire conference. And it was probably the most valuable lesson I ever learned in grad school. This Canadian professor comes in. He was a professor from Canada, but he collaborated with uh, Bell Labs. He's a pretty bright fellow. He comes in, and he says, oh, man, I just got off the plane. He's disorganized as anything. He says, I just got off the plane. And frankly, I was about ready to withdraw my paper from this conference because we weren't really getting really good measurements that lined up with what we were talking about. But then my grad students called with the, uh, some results 
from uh, this, these measurements that we had been taking as soon as I got off the plane. And they were really interesting, so I thought I'd present them. So he gets up. And keep in mind, this is the, the uh, era before ubiquitous projection. Everything was view graphs that you put on an overhead projector. We didn't have – we had PowerPoint, but you usually made, used PowerPoint to make the view graphs. Uh, there weren't, projection was very uncommon back then. TVs in every room. And so, but he didn't even have slides. He just put a blank transparency, took out his overhead markers, and just started drawing. And he was teaching. He was teaching. I know, in fact, one of my favorite quotes about teaching actually comes from the author of your book. When I was in his RF engineering class as an undergraduate, Professor Pratt, and he says, you know, guys, there are two pe reasons why people write research papers and technical papers. One is to look smart, and two is to teach something. He says, so the overwhelming per majority of people are writing for reason number one. He says, I want you guys to write for reason number two. So I always took that advice to heart. And same with this guy. He was actually teaching. He was drawing diagrams and showing how he was measuring things like multipath, and they were bouncing off of his building, and he was actually able to measure that effect, and what would that mean for a radio communications that was happening in a cell phone. It was very illustrative. He was very lucid, very clear, um, and so, you know, that was the one uh, presentation that that entire conference that didn't have anything to do with PowerPoint. And so that, that made me learn from an er early age not to trust PowerPoint. Now, when you go to a research conference nowadays, they expect it. And what's more, you have to give a lot of background material and you have to cover a lot of ground. They only give you 15 or 20 minutes to do it. So it's kind of a necessary evil. But I would encourage you, especially for those that are doing your PhD here and you'll be doing proposals and dissertation defenses, try to minimize the amount of PowerPoint. I find a lot of students just use it as a crutch. You know, they're just speaking the points on their slides. They're just hitting their audience with as much information as possible. But they're not really teaching, which is how you really know that you know the material. I always think that a Ph.D. defense at Georgia Tech, at some random location within the presentation, I, as a committee member, will jump up, run over to the plug, pull the outlet, pull the plug out of the outlet, and say, keep on going. Because you should know your content well enough to, give, to explain why it's novel and what the key research materials are, and et cetera, without having to rely on PowerPoint slides. It's so the blackout version of the defense. And right now, that guarantees that if there are any PhD students in this audience, I will not have to serve on your committee. You will not, I will not be requested to serve on your committee. So this little soliloquy has two purposes. One, to educate you about how to give public presentations. The other one, not to invite me onto your PhD proposal committee. Okay. Now... Where were we? Okay, we were about to ready to switch to PowerPoint. We talked about lossless compression. Things that we talked about were some very common algorithms like Huffman encoding, run length encoding. That's where you just suck out the sequence of zeros or ones, for example, in a binary stream, and you just say uh, one with X number of zeros. So you encode the, the character and then the number of occurrences of that character. And uh, that's a really nice way to do, for example, fax transmissions, image transmissions of documents, because you, you, it's a black and white image where there's just a lot of white space in the different scan lines. So that makes a lot of sense. Then we talked about this Lempel-Ziv algorithm, which was another way to do lossless compression, but you don't have to know the statistics of your source a priori. You can actually scan through and build your coding alphabet send the coding alphabet along with the data, um, and that winds up in the long run being the best way to do it. You tend to ha need larger bit sequences or larger file sizes in order to make that, um, to realize those gains. But that's nowadays, you know, it seems to take 10 megabits to, to send an email practically. So you almost always achieve those gains. And this is actually, the, this concept is actually the backbone of most types of compression um, algorithms, like the zip algorithm or other forms of compression in image. But now let's talk about some lossy compression. 
And uh, one that I want to talk about specifically because it shows up in satellite image transmissions is JPEG, uh, Joint Photographic Experts Guild. It was a um, standards body that got together in 1992. And the concept was, well, we know that the eye is very forgiving. And so let's try to um, make a standard that takes advantage of that, that throws away just the right kind of information that your eye is insensitive to. Not only will we compress the signal, but we'll also be actually losing data, but we'll be losing it in a way that, that your eye doesn't really care about. So to do this, you have to start by, by taking an RGB image, red, green, and blue. We talked about how to represent color in that way last class period. This is, those were the three metamers that most people seen, see in, and we can stimulate color, almost all the colors that you can possibly see, with just those three tri-stimulus values. So when we record an image, we have a red, gray, a red image, a green image, and a blue image on top of one another. And those three together, when we add them up, uh, will represent a nice color image. Now, that's not taking advantage, for example, of some sensitivities of your eyes. We know that your eyes have two types of uh, cells. We've got the color cells, which are, are the cones, and then the rods, which do intensity. And the, the rods are a lot denser than your color cells. In, the, in your retina, uh, there's, I forget what the density is, but there are a lot more rods than there are colors, color cells, which means your resolution for perceiving color is a lot lower than for perceiving intensity. And so it makes sense before you compress any image, regardless of what technique that you're doing, you repartition the information so that you have intensity and then some other channels that represent color. So for example, um, in JPEG, we change RGB to this, what's called Y, which is intensity, and then blue and red chrominance channels. So we still have three channels. You need three degrees of freedom to represent a pixel. But now it's going to be intensity and basically the amount of blue chrominance and red chrominance. You can get the green by subtracting the blue and the red out from the intensity with, with a special formula that's not always linear. But it's basically a, a way to arrange the uh, intensity information. And uh, in the case of JPEG, I believe that conversion is linear from what I remember. Now, you take the chrominance channel. So now you have three planes, three images. You downsample them. So already we're throwing away information. So for example, if you have a 100 by 100 pixel image, you keep the intensity at 100 by 100, but you downsample uh, the chrominance down to, say, 50 and 50 for the blue and 50 and 50 uh, for the red. So automatically, you've thrown away almost ha like half the information there, right? Yeah, half the information. But your eye, you've done it in a way that matches the biology of your eye. And so you, it's very difficult to tell that, that that's even happened from a, a high-resolution image. And then... The next thing, and I'll explain this next step in greater detail, you keep only the most significant frequency components. And by frequency, we talk about spatial frequency. Here's again, in a, we did this in antennas, and again in this class, it shows up again, this idea of spatial frequency content. I have an image signal that if I look at the roster lines in either X or Y, is a signal that's varying with respect to space. And because the Fourier transform is... Uh, it's just a mathematical way to reorganize information in a signal. It doesn't matter whether the signal is in the time domain or the frequency domain or in the, uh, the dollar domain or in whatever domain you're operating in, the temperature domain. That function can be reorganized into a unique Fourier transform. And these ideas of spectral content where low frequency spectrum represents subtle changes and high frequency spectrum content represents finer scale changes. Well, guess what your eye is sensitive to? It's the lower scale changes. 
And you can selectively, in a clever way, throw away the higher scale changes and save yourself a lot of bits to transmit, unbeknownst to the viewer in most cases. And then uh, you also add some run length encoding to uh, reduce the size on top of that, just to make sure that you've squeezed out any uh, redundancies. Now, there are several incarnations of the JPEG standard. The JPEG 2000 standard, for example, instead of using exact spec like sinusoidal spectral decomposition, uses more of a wavelet decomposition. It's just a non-sinusoidal basis function that you break your information into. And it happens that if you pick certain types of wavelets to do that, your, your image and the information that you throw away based on that transformation is a little less sensitive to your eye. It works almost exactly the way I'm going to show you for the basic JPEG standard, but you're using wavelets instead of sine waves to do your decomposition. Ah, uh, yes? How do night vision goggles work? How do night vision goggles work? This is a good question. How much of a digression do we want in this class? This is a, a subject of a, you could make a, um, make a, make a lecture unto itself on that. That's a really good question. I can, I'll give you the quick answer because it's interesting. You're talking about basically how do you record information that's outside of the frequency, the, visual, the visible frequency range of light? How do you transfer it up from either infrared, which is night vision, uh, where you're looking at heat, or in some cases night vision, you're really just taking like very, very low intensity um, electro, uh, optics and amplifying them, you know. And you're out on the Serengeti and you want to watch the lion eat its prey at night. I think they hunt at night. And you take your night vision goggles and uh, what little ambient starlight and moonlight you may have out there, you amplify it and turn it into something visible. So those are actually two different problems, the idea of thermal vision and the idea of night vision. But it turns out that you can solve them in a similar way. What you do is you have a... a the classical way to do this, I believe you can do this in solid state now, but the classical way to do this is you put some um, high potential medium in front of the lens that's sensitized to whatever wavelength that you're looking at. And by high potential, I mean you add a, a really high voltage drop between the front plane and the back plane where you actually do your put your photo detector. And so uh, often this is like a, a semiconductor material like gallium arsenide or something. You keep it at a very high potential. It's a very thin plane of material. A photon comes in, uh, strikes this material, and it releases an electron, which then, because of the high fields, is accelerated to very high speeds, and it, then it hits what's basically usually a phosphor screen, where it smashes into a phosphor dot, and... Uh, shoots out um, a really a stream of photons, a uh, burst of multiple photons. So in that way, it works like a really big optical amplifier. You're taking one little photon or a trickle of photons, and each of those results in this avalanche of photons that sprays light to what would then be a photo uh, detector. You could, do, you could actually do that on, you could actually look at the screen itself in the old goggles. Nowadays, there's a way to do this uh, with solid state where you can actually do the photon counting and the, the uh, avalanche and amplification in solid states. But that was how the old stuff worked. And you could actually tune it so that you could do thermal vision where it was infrared photons striking that a uh, activated plane or it would be just a regular visible light photon striking that. And then, of course, that would propagate through, amplify the image, and you could see the wildebeest dying at night. Did that answer your question? Okay. And it was inter interesting then. That's one of the reasons why most of those um, technologies produce black and white images. Well, you don't need chrominance to, to characterize that because the, they're sort of input 
frequency agnostic, right? Any photon that's within the range of the actionable, of the, the photomultiplying material or the whatever technique that you're using will produce this avalanche of electrons that then can be translated into an intensity, but not necessarily color. So you could, interestingly, you could maybe um, look at the frequency, try to translate the frequency down, but I think you'd have to have multiple channels of those, like uh, a material that was functionalized only to, uh, say, the lower end of the infrared spectrum or the lower end of the visible spectrum, and then a higher end, and then a higher end, and then do that those operations in parallel right, with some optical beam splitting. I don't know. I'm not an op optics guy, so it sounds like an interesting design. I don't even know if they have that kind of equipment up for for sale. Has anybody actually used like uh, color display night vision or infrared vision? I know sometimes they add color to something just to, for like uh, thermal displays, just to denote intensity, you know, hot or cold, blue, red or blue, but that's not actually the same as frequency selective translation of the thermal image. Anyway. We don't mind diversions in this class as long as they only take a few minutes. It's interesting. Okay. Um, so, let's see. How does this work? How does this throwing away of information work? Now, to do this, this uses a, a kind of a variation of the Fourier transform called the discrete cosine transform. And the idea here is that, let's say I have an 8 by 8 chunk of pixels like this. The normal way to think about an image in an 8 by 8 roster array is to think of it pixel by pixel. So my first pixel represents the intensity of uh, my signal at that particular pixel. And so you can think of it as a coefficient, which is my intensity, and for that image, a basis function. And that basis function for a roster by roster array is just a, a pixel of value 1 and in whatever pixel that I'm looking at and 0 elsewhere. That's a nice way to generate a display. But it turns out it's a lousy way to think about organizing the importance of information in an image. Rather, it's better to use a different set of basis functions, a set of basis functions where you can decompose the image into the same 8 by 8 array of, uh, or not array, but let's say 64 coefficients, but in a way that's better suited to your eye and how it perceives data. So for example, instead of a pixel by pixel basis sec uh, section, I have the set of basis functions used in a 2D discrete cosine transform up here on the board. And the way it is, up on the upper left-hand corner, you have uniform excitation of all of 64, uh, yeah, 64 pixels, the 8 by 8 array. And so you can think of this as the average intensity in that particular region of your image. So you take your image, you break it into 64, uh, these 8 by 8 image sections, and the for one image section that you grab out, that first upper left-hand uh, basis function represents the average intensity across that 8 by 8 set of pixels. To the, immediately to the right, you have essentially the first harmonic in the x direction. And this represents the gradient of intensity across the image in that 8 by 8 pixel section. So I could attach that a coefficient to that value and say, if it's zero, it says there's no gradient in that direction. If there's a strong gradient, you have a big coefficient. Anyway, those are the different numbers that I assign there. And of course, if I go to all the way to the left and down one, now I'm talking about the vertical gradient. I have either a positive or a negative coefficient for that. And it tells me which way the color slants on average across this 8 by 8, 64 pixel sub-image. And the thing is, you can start increasing the frequency content. You can talk about double the frequency content, triple, et cetera, as you move to the right or to the left. And of course, 
as you can also move diagonally where you get combinations of frequency content, multiple peaks in both the X and the Y direction, to the point where you get all the way down to the bottom right hand, uh, 8 by 8 pixel basis function. And it turns out that that, basis, that pixel basis function is a checkerboard, essentially. Alternating highs and lows in a checkerboard slash pattern. Now, if I just took a randomly generated image, I just took a, a big picture of white noise that I generated with the rand command in, a, in a MATLAB by sticking random uncorrelated points in every single roster of my, my image. If I did that, then decomposing a sub-image of that image, an 8 by 8 sub-image, would require 64 po points if I wanted to do it pixel by pixel. If I reorganized it with this set of basis functions, I would still have 64 coefficients, and there really would be no way to... I, I would probably excite each of those coefficients equally. For a more realistic image, there's two things that we can take advantage of. We don't excite these equally for your typical image. And what's more, your eye isn't very sensitive to some of these. Take a wild guess which of these components is the most sensitive to your eye in a, a, when you go to parse an image. Well, if you're looking at an 8 by 8 pixel sub-image, it's the average value, of course. It's the upper left-hand corner that you're the most sensitive to. Very fine scale changes, especially of the order that occur at the bottom right hand corner, your eye is very, so you can throw away that and you'll never know. So by using this subset, by, by partitioning the information in, in an image in terms of these 64 basis functions instead of a pixel by pixel, representation, allows us to identify the information that your eye is not sensitive to and throw it away. And that's the lossy part of the JPEG image compression algorithm. So let me show you. And of course, the really neat thing about this is that not only does this allow for lossy compression, but it also allows for the quality of the image. You can basically control the quality that you save this image and represent it with. I'm sure you've noticed that when you've gone to do your own image production with the computer that there's a little slider bar or something that says, how crummy do you want this image to be? Right? And so there's a trade-off between the quality and, of course, the number of bits that the image will save as. Now, the algorithm in JPEG just is basically starts at the bottom right-hand corner and zigzags through the image, throwing away coefficients associated with these... Um, uh, basis functions, such that the, the bottom right-hand corner will be thrown away first, then the next set of diagonals, then the next, then the next, then the next, then the next. And at, at the very last, your average value, and maybe the first and two gradients, they're the last to go. But then the image starts to look pretty crummy and kind of blocky. You've probably even noticed that in some instances. So let's do, if you can see this on the screen, I don't know how the contrast will be, but uh, here's four images. And I did that exercise where I went ahead and I took this beautiful mountainscape picture. I took this myself in uh, hiking with some Georgia Tech students in the mountains of Colorado. It's saved to be 42 kilobytes. This uh, image, all the pictures were... Uh, they're, they're 422. So what that really means is that I subsampled the in intensity image, the intensity channel of the image, and I subsampled, subsampled the chrominance channels at half that rate. So I forget what the dimensions of this particular image is, but if it was, say, 200 by 100, my, my intensity image was 200 by 100, and then my blue and red chrominance channels were 100 by 50 each. And then I applied 
the wave, uh, the discrete cosine transform to each of those, both the color and the intensity planes. And then I threw away the information up to a certain point. So at 42 kilobytes, I'm keeping uh, uh, maybe half of the information. I'm only throwing away a few. And I see I get a nice image. To the right, I'm cutting the storage capacity down to half. And so I, I resulted in about a 23 kilobyte image. And I can't really, at least with this crummy display that I'm using right now, you can't really see the difference, can you? There's no perceptible way. Maybe if I blew this up and increased the contrast and we put this on the big screen, you could. Then I go down to 13 kilobytes where I've cut the capacity. I'm throwing away even more information. And I, it's hard with this display to even see a difference on that. But then when I go down to 9 kilobytes where I'm throwing away just about everything except for the, the first or the second co coefficients, the first couple coefficients, now you can start to see some blockiness. And I'm basically getting rid of all of the details in that discrete cosine transform, except for the, the average value. And maybe a, a couple of gradients. So let's do another exercise. This is kind of an interesting comparison. I ripped these two. Uh, Let's say I ripped one of these images off the web because I wanted a cartoon to work with. So I just grabbed this Simpsons picture. And uh, then I took this, uh, I think this was another landscape photograph I took in Hawaii. I was hiking with some Georgia Tech students. And uh, obviously two very different images, right? And so let's apply different types of lossless and lossy compression to them to see how we do in terms of the number of bits we need to transmit on the wireless channel to transfer this information. So the first thing, I, I used an uncompressed bitmap so that we could baseline it. And the Simpsons took 341 kilobytes uncompressed. Uh, the Kauai photograph was much higher resolution. It took three megabytes to uh, grab off my digital camera at the time. And then I applied uh, PCX, which is a, a file format that was originally developed and used mostly for the fax machines, and so that's using run length encoding. Now, you'll notice that the run length encoding hardly does anything for the Kauai photograph. There are some regions in that photograph, if I go back to it, where maybe I have the same pixel repeated in a scan line. Maybe that blue area up in the sky, there are a few, or in the white clouds, there are a few. Maybe there are some shades of green that are the same. And so, or some black area, that shadowy area, there may be some dark pixels. But by and large, I get very little savings when I do that. You see, it only dropped about 10%, saved 10% of my space. The Simpsons, however, got cut in half. Why? Well, we can see that very clearly. This is a cartoon image. There's a lot of repeated lines, right? This is crappy American animation that doesn't shade anything. It's just all about the jokes, and so, very easy to compress with run length encoding. If this was something like Japanese animation, we'd be having trouble with PCX, right? Because they don't put all the, the little details and shadings in it. Okay. Now, if you use the GIF standard, that applies. That is a lossless technique. And they do run length encoding plus Lempel ziv. And you see, ooh, look at that. The Simpsons got even smaller because now we're adding Lempel Ziv, but most of the information was redundancy. Most of the gains were in redundancy. So you see that the big jump was going from nothing to run length encoding, not run length encoding to uh, Lempel Ziv. And Kawhi, ooh, run, Lempel Ziv is actually very effective in that image. Why is that? Take a look at the image. If we just use that, lossless encoding, we see that there's a lot of detail in this image, but there are also a lot of repeated patterns that aren't necessarily straight lines of the same color, but the forest, you kind of get these similar repeated gradations of different shades of green. You got a sky region where it's all kind of white and blue. You got a sand, big sand region 
where it's not the same adjacent color exactly, one after another, but it's similar combinations of colors. And so you see Lempelzit does a great job of building the alphabet up and removing and finding what the patterns are and removing a lot of the redundant information. Same with the C below. And so we go over here, we say, oh, that, that works well. I got almost 90% uh, reductions when I applied uh, Lempelziv. Now, of course, in both instances, when I do JPEG, that's when I get the least amount of data required to represent the image. Why? Because now I'm actually throwing information away. If I took that JPEG file, unlike the other three, I could not reconstitute my original image. I would have some deviations that I could notice. Hopefully, there, it's in such a way that uh, it does not significantly uh, affect my perception of the image. And you can see that at the end of the day, the Simpsons is compressing down to about 75. Kauai is going down to 142. Interestingly, Kauai is almost 10 times the information when you first start out, but it winds up only being about twice the information because at the end of the day, your eye is just not very sensitive to find details in images. And I can squeeze a surprising amount of the out of the Kauai image and still have it look exactly like that from your perception. Ah, yeah. They were directly from the original. So I didn't, I didn't do one, then the other, then the other. So I always started with my uncompressed bitmap and achieved these file sizes. And of course, it's going to vary dramatically from picture to picture. But this kind of gives you an idea and some intuition about the difference between lossy compression or lossless compression and the types of redundancy that certain types of compression schemes are designed to remove and how that translates into either a still image or ultimately what we want to do is video. Good question. Always the JPEG is always the best in terms of fewest number of bits, but of course lossy. That's what, one of the key takeaways. Now, what does this have to do with video? Well, it turns out that you use almost the exact same types of techniques that were applied to JPEG. You just do it to now a frame, a moving frame of pictures. Now, it turns out that there's even more redundancy in uh, a moving image in like a, a picture, a video, than there is in a still. So if you do uncompressed video, you can quickly overwhelm even the most powerful com uh, <coughs> communications medium because it takes an enormous amount of, of bits. If you're doing, say, 24 frames per second, you're transmitting a high-resolution image. And you're doing that 24 times per second. So now I take what would normally take, what do we say, the quiet image was three megabytes uncompressed. And I gotta multiply that by 24. I'm looking at like 75 megabytes per second to do uncompressed video. If I wanted to store a movie that was like two hours long on a compact disc or some, some other form of medium, oh my heavens, that would take a huge amount of data. And so I need to find ways to compress things if I want to store video or if I want to transmit them on a radio interface where spectrum is a precious and valuable resource. So how do I do that? Well, the best video compression algorithms are three-dimensional, essentially. They take advantage not only of the patterns in the images, but also the patterns in, the, in time. Um, in fact, many of them will even apply motion vectors where there's enough pattern recognition built into uh, the encoders so that they know that if I take a picture of a car moving across the screen or the image, that there should be a block of compressed data that I use and track the car motion because that's going to be highly redundant from one scene to the next. And then there's going to be static background where I can kind of lay that image on top of. And so I can almost encode those separately. Now, of course, there's always a trade-off. The more redundancy you remove, the more catastrophic bit errors become. 
And you've probably seen this on some of your own satellite TV, right? Uh, first of all, you know that they're using some sort of JPEG-like encoding where they're using subframes and special coefficients to represent uh, the majority of the information in those little 8 by 8 pixel frames. Why? Because if you say, say you have a rainstorm, the raindrops are coming down, you're losing link margin, and you're operating just above that threshold of operability, and you lose an occasional bit. First of all, that's actually a very difficult point to, to reach, because unlike analog video signals that degrade very gracefully with respect to SNR, digital schemes, the way that they're optimized now, they either work or they don't. They either work perfectly, and then there's a brief transition region where you start to get a few errors, and then forget it. You're not going to get anything. When you're operating close to that region, though, you can look on your video, and you start to see blocks appear, right? Error blocks in the video. And what's more, those error blocks tend to persist over the course of several seconds, right? Why? Because you've wiped out a critical bit that's containing an, a very important piece of information for that entire region, that 8 by 8 pixel region, for example. And what's more, that region is persistent over many frames of video data. And so it winds up being visible and persistent. It's not just a blip that flashes and disappears. So in terms of how to encode that, back in 1988, this Moving Pictures Expert Guild, MPEG-1, was put together, a standardization body, and they developed some specs for encoding, encoding analog video and audio. Now, of course, this also includes the um, uh, audio, MPEG Layer 3 audio, or MP3. So when people, you hear the term MP3, they're actually talking about the audio standard that went to the in original MPEG-1 uh, video encoding standard. There is also an MPEG-3, but it's not the same thing as MP3. And then video based on uh, digitizing analog TV signals. This was a way to digitally archive all of the analog video footage that was being produced at the time. That's what this con standard concentrated on. So it would take, by, uh, you'd archive the analog video footage on a digital medium. The resolution wasn't particularly high, but you could at least put those types of signals on a CD. You could record audio with the MP3 standard, and it's generally unsuitable for the higher resolution pick digital images, native digital images that we're used to seeing. But this was 1988, so give them a break, right? They just, the real goal here was to archive all the analog video that was being shot and all the analog uh, films. Now, a few p pieces of information. MPEG-1 supports resolutions up to 4,095 by 4,095 at 12-bit uh, quantization and bit rates up to 100 megabits per second. That's pretty much overkill because you don't need, that. that's the highest resolution. But it turns out you don't need nearly that much to uh, quantize your classical analog TV signal, for example. The most commonly uh, used ones were 352 by 240, 352 by 288, or 320 by 240, depending on what the aspect ratio was of your video signal. And the bit rates would be, at those levels, would be 1.5 megabits per second or less. You split the image, you partition it again into Y uh, intensity with the Y channel, and then CB, which is your blue chrominance, and CR, your red chrominance. And then you subsample the color signals, just like JPEG. And then you apply some 3D compression, 2D image, and then temporal changes. So like most good video standards, all the MPEG standards are actually, in many instances, looking at the differences between frames and encoding those, not the actual images themselves. And then you'll insert a reference frame of an entire image just to recalibrate things to make sure if you lost an error, it's not you had an error in a critical bit, it's not catastrophic. You can recover in a second or two from that error. Now, MPEG-2 came along later, and that was meant more for the higher definition transmissions, and that was capable of HDTV-type transmissions. And the applications are, of course, putting high-res 
images on DVDs. Um, the peak data rates are much higher, 10 megabits per second. And the maximum resolution for most videos and DVDs is actually 720 by 480 pixels until it was extended later. And this is how uh, original di digital video broadcasts in Europe operated. And also the ATSC, the digital standard that replaced uh, analog television in nor North America. So let's see. Um, interestingly, the, the partition that they used for doing images, somebody did some research and found there was an even better way to partition the information and encode it so that your eye is less sensitive to it. They used this, what's called YUV. Y is intensity, and then there's two types of uh, color channels, U and V, but they uh, partition the information in a very different, different way. Let me show you here. So on the right-hand side, on the top, you have the, this image of, a, of uh, a barn in the mountains, it looks like. And then the three channels below it, the intensity channel, which is your black and white intensity, the light and the dark parts of the signal. And then this kind of uh, bluish green channel, which is your U, and your kind of greenish red channel yellowish red channel in the bottom, which is your V channel. Just a different way to partition that color information. And it turns out, again, this is a way that your eye is even less sensitive to if you do it in these two and then subsample and then throw away information. And there's this kind of conversion scheme for uh, partitioning the, the images in this manner. There's a way to convert RGB to these chromas fairly straight linear formula. So MPEG-4 came along. This is in 1998. And this had added all these bells and whistles like copywriting, 3D features, interactivity, uh, some things that you'd use for like DVDs especially. Um, and a pr improved coding efficiency for video, audio, and speech. Extra error detection and correction abilities. Uh, it's interesting that mostly the digital broadcasts originally in digital satellite TV was MPEG-2, and I think almost everybody has m migrated over to MPEG-4 now as the primary scheme. The bells and whistles are different, but the functioning about how the bits are representing color, how they are compressed with lossy compression, uh, is it basically the same. The same. The fundamentals are all the same. You change the channel slightly. You do your lossy compression slightly differently. You use wavelets instead of cosine transforms, but it's the same thing, same concept. So, this is a summary of what we've learned so far. Sampling, quantization, compression of the lossless and the lossy variety. In video, we use those MPEG stan standards mostly for the transmission of video data on satellites, satellite links. They also include a spec for the audio specification. We still have not actually transmitted these bits wirelessly, though. What we're talking about has been related to coding and decoding. In fact, you'll even heard that, hear, hear those operations put together and say, oh, this uh, piece of software has a codec, or this, rate, this uh, hardware has a codec for the operation of coding and decoding image information or audio information. What we need now to do is to add the ability to modulate and demodulate the information on a wireless channel. So we do not need a codec. We need a modem, right? This is, uh, engineers are remarkably unoriginal when they come up with the names for things, right? Codecs and modems, code, decode, modulate, demodulate, right? 